open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 25. Genesis chapter 25. And uh, it's great to be with you this morning. It's been an uh, adventuresome time for my wife and I. My wife and I actually pastored in uh, Newport News, Virginia for the last five years, and we actually moved back to the seminary to uh, finish school there and uh, got a chance to learn from Joe and Professor, I call him Professor Crocker, Ward. He wants me to call him Ward, but I call him Professor. So they are right. Here's my disclaimer. Anything bad that I say, <laughs> lay it their account because they taught me. Conversely, anything good that I say, do not give them any credit for whatsoever because it isn't, sp- no, I'm just kidding. I know, I know, I know. Let's pray. <laughs> hey, Ward, how are you? So far, so good. Good. <laughs> Jesus, we do thank you for your grace, um, without which we wouldn't be able to stand. And Lord God, we thank you for the power of your word. The power is not in men, it is in your word. It is in your word spoken plainly, truthfully, and in line with what it is that you've said to us. And I do pray that it would go forth and bless your people this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. One of the great things about reading the Old Testament is this. Most of us don't really think about it, but the Old Testament is written about four or five hundred years after the event, and possibly longer than that if we're talking about Genesis, but Genesis, I mean, uh, the beginnings, creation. But Moses wrote this story about Abraham, you know, 500 years after the fact. And Moses didn't write willy-nilly. He chose specifically what he would say about Abraham, particularly in this chapter of Genesis chapter 25, and you guys have been working your way through that diligently and studying about Abraham. And in this chapter, is it 25? Yeah, just 25. And in this chapter, we see the death of Abraham. Abraham died. And if you'll notice in this chapter, God records his death. So we know that he did die. But it's also recorded that Abraham had many sons. And if you remember the story, and I'm sure you've heard, Abraham didn't have his first son until he was about 100 years old. He was about 100 years old when he had his first son. And then what we see in the last 75 years of Abraham's life, summed up in verse 8, where it says in verse 8 this, Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of youth, I'm sorry, full of years, and was gathered to his people. It's the summary of his life. He had his children that God promised him. Not merely a son, God promised him that he would be the father of many generations, of many nations. And here Abraham is, dead, his story being written by someone else, and the faithfulness of God being displayed in what God wrote and what Moses wrote about him. And as I was reading this and studying this, I was reflecting on some things that I've heard in the last couple of weeks. And uh, the first thing, I was reminded of the guy, remember the guy who killed Osama bin Laden, Robert Robert O'Neill? And I think this is the first time that I ever heard this kind of summary of about of a son's love for his dad. Robert O'Neill was about to quit when he was in BUDS. BUDS is basic underwater dive school. And as he was about to quit, one of the SEAL instructors, and you know the SEAL instructors are absolutely hard people. They don't care whether you quit. If you're going to quit, they're like whatever because they don't want quitters on their team. But one of the SEAL instructors said to Robert, he said, that when you go and ring that bell, they make sure that you take your helmet off and you place your name squarely facing you, and under the bell, and then you ring it. And he said, look at the name on that helmet. He said, that's not just your name. That's your father's name that you're putting there. So that when you lay that helmet on the ground, you're not merely laying down your name. You're laying down the name that your father gave you. And it really struck me. And it was, that was probably about four or five months ago. And then yesterday, I happened to see an interview with James Harrison, of the Steelers. Ooh. I know. And, and, and James Harrison, to me, is, is an amazing individual. I mean, just an amazing physical specimen. And if you remember, if you're a Steelers fan, you remember, last year, the year before last, James Harrison was accused of doping. That all of his abilities and all of his successes came from 
doping, and James Harrison was being interviewed about that, and he said, when they accused me, he said, I was angry. He said, I was angry because, he said, that's my daddy's name. He said, I would never do anything to disgrace my daddy's name. And I thought about it. Here are two men, two different backgrounds, two different fathers, and they both recognize the value and the legacy of the name that they were given. And I thought to myself, thought about myself, and I thought about my own dad. Now, my story is just very interesting. I have two men's names for my name. My, my last name is Hill. That's from a man that my mother married named Vernon. Never saw him, never met him, is not my father. The man who raised me, his name is Leroy, and I got his first name, so I don't know how that all worked out. But my father, his name is Frank. My father is still alive, but my dad passed away. And as I think about my dad, my dad lived a very hard and a very difficult life. My dad was an alcoholic. My dad was abusive to my mother, particularly to my mother. My dad was the reason why our family was broke up and was destroyed. But I had to think through as an adult what kind of man my father was and his life experience, what led him to the things that he did and the man that he became. And I took away from my father all the good parts. I recognized, I didn't dismiss the bad parts because you can't do that. But I put him in context, and I saw my, the man that my father was, and I thought about the legacy of the man that he really wanted me to be. I can never forget this. The day that I came home from Marine Corps boot camp, and I was standing there in my uniform at parade rest, and my dad was standing there, and he stuck out his hand. I actually, he said, son, give me a kiss. And that was one of the things he would say to me, and I would say, no, dad, I'm in uniform. <laughs> Not happening. So I said, thank you. Here's my hand to shake it. But they grabbed me by the hand, drew me in close, and smacked a wet kiss on me. <laughs> I never forget that about him because my dad loved me. And as I was thinking about all this, I was reflecting on the different backgrounds and reflecting on Abraham and the legacy that Abraham led. Now, if you think of Abraham's sons, they weren't all that great, were they? Jacob became that way. We didn't start out that way. And Esau was a fool, and Isaac, the son of promise, finds himself at the end of his life trying to distort, distract, take away from the plan that God gave him. So Abraham didn't raise the greatest sons either, did he? But those aren't the sons that we really count technically. We count as spiritual ones, right? We count the ones who came from his faith. And I hope this, I hope that you can kind of relate to what I'm saying. Maybe some of you grew up in the same kind of house that I did. Maybe some of you had the same kind of father that I did. Or maybe some of you didn't have that kind of father. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you grew up in a great house and maybe you had a great dad. Either way, I think the word of God has something to say to us in Abraham's story. Because Abraham's story is a story, particularly in this chapter, that we look back on and we reflect on the life that he lived. And we kind of see it through Moses' eyes. We kind of do. Moses highlights all of the things that Abraham did in his life, in this story. He doesn't tell us every single detail, does he? It's not possible for him to. But he records what's necessary. And the great thing for all of us is that God gave us this word that we're going to look through today so that we can see the faithfulness of God to keep his word and to keep his promises to Abraham despite the man that Abraham was for you and me. So the first six verses, and I won't cover all these six verses because it's just too many of them, right? But what do you see in the first six verses? You see Abraham took a wife, got married again, and Abraham had multiple children, multiple sons. Listen to some of their names, Jokshan, Sheba, Dedan, Midian, Ishbak, Shua, Zimran. These are just a bunch of crazy names, by the way. I would never imagine going through life with a name like Jokshan. That'd be difficult, almost like being a fan of a certain team. You just wouldn't want to go through life like that. <laughs> but we don't often think about it. Moses wrote these stories, and he called out a portion of Abraham's life for you and me to kind of get our minds around. And here's the thing. What we see in those first six verses in all the names is that God was faithful to his promise to Abraham. God was faithful. Here it is. 
175 years. Abraham's dead. And Moses records for you and me, God is faithful. Why? God promised that, Moses, that Abraham would have sons. And here are the sons that Abraham has. Genesis 15 says this to Abraham. God in his vision says, do not fear, Abraham. I am a shield to you. Your reward will be great. Abraham said to God, O oh Lord, this is Genesis 15, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? God, I don't have any sons. I don't have a legacy to leave. And Abraham said, you've given me no offspring. To me, no one is born an heir in my house. And then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside and he said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars. If you're able to count them, and he said, so shall your descendants be. Then he believed the Lord, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God. Now, when you look up that verse there, what it really means is that Abraham put his trust in God at that moment when God made a promise to him. He put his trust in God. And I know today that that's very difficult when you have friends who don't believe that God exists. And they're often frustrated with you because you do put your trust in God. What is that like to put your trust in God, to have all of your hopes rested in him? To have all of who you are rested on who he is. You live today, you live in a world that is high touch, hopeless, frustrating, difficult. You put your hope in people that you elect in the office and they don't do what they say they're going to do. You have people consistently trying to detract from the word of God to tell you that the word of God is different from what it is or to tell you that reality is different from what it actually is. And the tendency for you and me is to not hope in God, but to hope in what you and I can ourselves accomplish, what you and I can bring about by our own strength. But Paul says something a little bit different about Abraham. Paul said, when faced with the facts, being 100 years old, and God having promised him that he would bring him descendants, that Abraham hoped against hope so that he might be a father to many nations. He didn't become weak. He didn't waver. And though his wife is as good as dead, 100 years old, her womb, it says, as good as dead, he did not waver in unbelief. And because of that, God accredited his faith as righteousness. Abraham understood the reality of his situation. Think about it. When Abraham died, Isaac was 75 years old. When Abraham died, Jacob was 15 years old. Abraham got to see the promises of God come to fruition in his life. Not all of them, but he got to see many of them. Thomas Constable writes this, Abraham's rest, hopes rested solely on God's promise. He had no hope of attaining descendants naturally. His faith was not a condition for the reception of the promise, but he believed with the intention of receiving the promise. He still believed in God. And you know, I'm going to tell you something. That's a very interesting statement for myself because... I get a chance to hang around people all the time who are talking about God. I get a chance to hang around people who are writing interesting things about God. And the God that I grew up believing in was this vibrant and active God who was visible and at work in the world. And I grew up with a set of rules or thinking about the world that were really solid, I thought, until the last five or ten years when my wife and I's lives began to take a little bit of a tumble go in a different direction than we'd planned. And as we began to work through some of these things and see how the world is changing around us, and the temptation for me was to just grow frustrated, to not believe the things that God had planted in me, to not believe that 
the hopes that her and I both have to accomplish before our life passes away would come to fruition, and to be frustrated, and to be frustrated. And as I look to Abraham in this uh, season, he's dead, he's gone, and I see the faithfulness of God in the text. It doesn't really come out where the scripture says God was faithful to Abraham, but the truth says Abraham had sons. He had many sons where he had no sons, and now he has sons. Even though it may have taken 25 years for the event to actually happen, he had sons. And I would say to you as an encouragement that the hope that you've placed in God, you need to maintain it. People are trying to make your hope die the death of a thousand qualifications. Stop it. Believe God. Believe him. Verses 5 to 11, we see that Abraham is the father of faith. Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, it says in verse 5, but Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines which Abraham had, and while he was still living, he sent them eastward away from Isaac and to his son to the, to the country of the east. This is the sum of Abraham's life, which he lived 175 years. And it says he breathed his last and he died in a good old age, an old man full of, you, full of years and has been gathered to his fathers. Abraham, when it says that he was satisfied in his years, how many people do you know died satisfied in the years that they've lived? Satisfied. That they've led the life that they really wanted to live. That they believe the things and then they live them out. So much so that when they die, they're satisfied. Who wants to die that way? I do. My wife says to me consistently, she said this to me on the way here. She said, I want to pray more than I did 20 years ago. She said, I want to believe God for more than I did 25 years ago. I don't want to believe God less now than I did when I was younger in the Lord. And she said, I don't want to miss what God has for us. Abraham is saying, the writer, Moses, is saying that Abraham didn't miss what God had for him. And I'm going to tell you something. 175 years is a long time to live. Not only is it a long time to live, it's a long time to persevere, to be obedient in a long direction. It's a long time to persevere, isn't it? But he did. And I don't think that he persevered in all the big decisions, because we know that Abraham failed big time, don't we? We know that he failed big time. But he stayed the course. He stayed the course. And what I would say to you is stay the course. Stay in it. Stay engaged. Have your heart engaged with the Lord. One of the things I love about this church is that you actually do break up in the middle of the message and you actually talk about it. These are not just words for you that at some point in the next two or three minutes that we're going to stop and you're going to talk about some questions that I have for you. And that's a way to stay engaged. That's a way to make the message, the word of God, relevant to you. But I want to say four things to you, why Abraham was able to be satisfied, why he was able to remain satisfied in the Lord. And those four things you can find in Hebrews chapter 11. The first thing is when he was tested by God, guess what? He obeyed God. When he was tested, he obeyed. He didn't love the world too much. His relationship toward the world was as a pilgrim and a sojourner. In other words, he recognized that he was just passing through. You're here for a short season. As a matter of fact, being a Christian, we're in our, each other's lives for a short season. We're only in each other's lives for a short season. And God often moves us on. And when Abraham died, having been approved by faith, Abraham did not receive everything that he was supposed to get. He received some of it, but he didn't get it all. So how do you and I persevere? When we're tested, we need to obey. We need to remember that this world is not all that there is. The comfort that comes with living in the world is not all that there is. Living an unsettled life right now is not necessarily a bad thing. Being uncomfortable is not being bad. Being comfortable and not being forward thinking is bad. 
being unsettled is not a bad thing. And that all the things that God has placed in your heart to do, you probably won't do it all in this life. But what you can do, you do it as under the Lord. You persevere in it. So we're going to take a break right now. And you have four questions, three or four questions, that you're going to kind of work through. And then we'll come back and sum up those questions. All right. I hope you had a lot of time to talk. And uh, hope you've talked about some good things. And so report out um, from anyone, Ward. <laughs> what's, yeah, I'm going to call on Ward because it's a good point. Ward, talk about what you just talked about at our table. I think it's important. See, see, you see how you see how good I tried to be. I didn't even. I know, right? You know. I wasn't sure which conversation we were talking. About. Oh, anyone? We didn't talk about the Eagles. No. What? Why talk about greatness? <laughs> Going to die. Here. Anyhow. So, in summation, what are we to do? What are we to do going forward? What kind of people? Do we really want to be? I, I think of a young man that I knew. I was a high school football coach. Ward, you were right. I've done just about everything. I was a high school football coach. And this, guy, this kid was my quarterback. And I remember him going off to boot camp. And I got a phone call from him at boot camp. And I've been to Marine Corps boot camp. And Marine Corps boot camp is not the most spiritual place that you're ever going to go. So this kid calls me and he says, you know, coach, I'm having Bible studies every Sunday night. I'm like, what are you talking about Bible studies? He says, oh, no, they let us read the Bible on Sunday nights. What are you talking about? They let you read the Bible on Sunday nights. He goes, no, they let us have Bible studies. And I have like 14 or 15 guys in my Bible study every Sunday night. And I thought about it and I was convicted. Because when I went to Marine Corps boot camp, all I was really interested in was getting through. But here was a young man that took his faith and he said, I'm going to live it out in the most extreme and the most harsh environment that I can. And it will be a light with what I believe. Now, I think that Blake lived out the legacy, not only that his father sowed into him, but that the many youth leaders and the many pastors that he was given sowed into him. And he took it to one of the most extreme places, and he changed his environment. Not because of what he said, but because of how he lived and what he believed. And Abraham, being the father of faith, and what I was telling the folks at our table, Abraham didn't have an example. Abraham was a trailblazer. There was no scriptures for Abraham to read. There was nothing for him to point at. God said for Abraham to do something, and in Abraham obeyed him. And because Abraham obeyed him, he became the father of many nations. And because Abraham believed in him, he was convinced. He was convinced about what he believed in. And I think for you and me, in order to be change agents in our environment, change agents in our family, right? Change agents in our family, for our house to be saved, to live out the promises of God through scripture, to be faithful in the times and the place that you and I are placed in, we need to believe in God. We need to trust in God. Our hopes need to be rested in him. And the legacy that we all hope to leave, the one where people talk about us, like our friend said, not that I was a good guy or not that I was a nice dresser or whatever, but that I manifested this character that God gave us, right? the one that we try to live into, that I manifested that, and that people actually believed, they actually believed because of the truths that we shared with them. I think those are the things that we really want to walk away with. I'm not really interested in uh, having my father's name be great. I'm not really interested in that. I love my dad. I'm not really interested in that because to do that would be to make him into something that he really wasn't, right? And I say that honestly, if my dad was here, he, I would say it to him. 
Um, I've had a long time to reflect on that, and I would say it to them. But what I will do is I'll live for the name that God gave me. I'll be the man that God called me to be. And I think if we're the men and women that God called us to be faithful in that is all that we can act, actually do. Yes, Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature.